right, uh, we are now on our second panel, Energy and Economics in Central Asia. Um, unfortunately, Ambassador Dr. Gulov did not receive his visa in time. So as you can see, we will have an all-female panel, which is uh, great, um, on this subject. And our first speaker will be Nadja Badikova. She's Executive Director of Antares Strategy. She's Deputy Chair of the Advisory Board of WStream Transcaspian Company. Uh, previously, she was a Senior Associate in the Russia-Eurasia Program at CSIS, uh, and a senior fellow at the European Research Center at the George Washington University. Uh, and prior to that, she was an adjunct professor at the Elliott School of International Affairs at, at GW. So please. Thank you so much for um, introduction, and thank you so much for inviting me. But indeed, it was a challenge. Um, to accept this, you know, invitation from Andy because I don't have any issues with the domestic, uh, with the domestic economics right now. My last probably um, research or job it was back in 2009. But anyway, it was you know great pleasure again to just look at look through numbers and. Um, see what is going on in the region. I will try to, this is <coughs> very wide topic, and we can discuss about this maybe days. Probably it could be the course. But I have only 20 minutes, so that's why. I will try my best to talk only about some issues and challenges um, which Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan face. And I try to, um, give us some outlook how they will be able to manage this. Um, <clears throat> first, let's see what is Central Asia. As we see the population, oh, the first, I use the International Monetary Fund information and as well the World Bank. Most of the time you can see that sometimes they provide different numbers, it's a different methodology, and probably you have different numbers as well, maybe countries has different numbers. And, uh, but anyway, to see the picture and see the trend, I just to stick to the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. Population and GDP, current GDP, it's 2017, and GDP per capita, in order to understand where we are right now. The most, um, the biggest economy is uh, Kazakhstan. The biggest market is Uzbekistan because of population. If we take a GDP per capita, it will be Kazakhstan because of oil. And a second country, it will be uh, Turkmenistan because of gas. And uh, so I will try to talk about Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan in terms of only that resources which they have in common. And in this case, let's check the uh, regional oil and gas overview to eliminate when I talk about Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan oil. When it comes to oil and proven reserves, it will be Kazakhstan leading in the Central Asia. And you see the production and as well the consumption it's, a num it's a information from the uh, BP report. Again, if we just to check the national statistics, the numbers will be much higher. Yes, proven reserves, we will see that um, a leading country will be in Central Asia, of course, Turkmenistan. It's a fourth country in the world in terms of uh, gas reserves. Russia is the first number one, and I put Azerbaijan and um, Russia just to make a reference and show you where these guys um, and what the market here. And uh, proven reserves, it doesn't mean that it is uh, just proven and that's the end of the story. Tomorrow, not, maybe not tomorrow, maybe in a year or five years, it will be a completely different story. Depends on the investment um, uh, states. Uh, made uh, or make or will make in uh, in exploration and development exploration particularly and numbers will change dramatically Uzbekistan you will see that has a, a Much lower proved reserves, but it doesn't mean anything. They didn't spend money 
uh, for last maybe 10, 15 years for exploration. So if they will try to do that, the numbers will be completely different. Not, not dramatically different, but will be much higher, I believe. So in terms of gas, Turkmenistan is 10% uh, of the uh, world gas reserves. Russia, it's 18%. And you can see the huge difference. Population in Turkmenistan, it's only about 6 million people. But Russia, it's much, much higher. Uh, so that's why I will stick to the gas and will try to find the common uh, challenges which the Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan has and as well how they will, how they manage this and how should probably they manage and they are doing, by the way. So gas production and uh, consumption, you will see that uh, Turkmenistan uh, consumption only 46%. But in Uzbekistan, it's, a, it's about 80% of gas. So Uzbekistan predominantly were concentrated on production of gas and using domestically. But um, uh, Turkmenistan, of course, it's most of the time it's export the gas. So when we can as well say that it's, um, Turkmenistan is a highly export-driven economy, but Uzbekistan as well. But only 30% of the earnings from gas is uh, in 30% uh, earnings from the gas, but rest of the other products. It means that Uzbekistan is is in 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 some advantage. It's much better position than Turkmenistan because Turkmenistan rely only on gas, and all you know volatilities in the market will immediately have a serious impact on um, foreign earnings. Uh, but um, when it comes to Uzbekistan, they use, yeah, 80% of uh, gas they use domestically. But, uh, and um, in, the, in, the, in the slide, you can see that I put that Uzbekistan um, industrial sector insufficient and uh, lack of modern technologies. And as well, it accounts about 40% of uh, uh, energy used in industry. And that's why it's uh, the most uh, um, energy intensive country in the world. It's, uh, it's about 35% much higher than in Kazakhstan and three times higher than in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Germany, for instance. Um, but the government aware that it's a serious problem and tried to, to, to adopt different measures and programs to reduce um, to reduce uh, this high energy intensity. So in the goal in 2018, uh, 2000, by 2030, government wants to uh, reduce the using energy, uh, energy intensity in 50%. Uh, um, so, but difference, as I said, Uzbekistan has uh, more mineral resources and diverse expert and is in, in a better match position when it comes to uh, market and prices. Real GDP, it's uh, um, the same trend will be in real GDP and probably in the price of the gas, oil, and as well inflation if we go in next hour slides. Um, in Turkmenistan, GDP depends on the gas. So it's about 35, 25, 30% uh, of uh, GDP is uh, earnings from the gas or contribute, you know, gas. Uh, but in Uzbekistan, it's much lower. Um, you see in uh, 2014, it was the price shock, very low price. Uh, oil prices and as well gas prices in the international market and uh, GDP in uh, Turkmenistan if you see the hydrocarbon GDP it was uh, in 2016 minus 48 but um, non hydrocarbon GDP it was uh, still okay we it's um, the next table it's a current balance percentage to the GDP you will see minus beginning of 2015. Um, the same, but maybe less 
shock experiences Pakistan. The current uh, account balance, it's only in 2018, was minus 83, but it doesn't make, uh, this doesn't relate to the, the prices on international markets. It's completely purely internal issues, which the, it's not even issues which the Uzbekistan has uh, since 2016. Um, 2016. Um, it's interesting that e external debt in Uzbekistan it's raised dramatically. It's uh, now it's around 41 percent of GDP, but still international monetary fund consider this it's okay. Uh, Turkmens they don't provide they don't provide this information about external debt. But um, I don't believe that they ha have much higher debt than Uzbekistan because uh, to mitigate the impact of the uh, price vol volatility and the markets, um, um, uh, markets, you know, adverse, you know, impact. Turkmenistan tried to use uh, reserves. And this picture is interesting. It was provided by Turkmenistan. Stati statistical authority in Turkmenistan, and you will see that real, you know, connection and um, between the GDP and uh, gas prices. It's a very strong correlation, and uh, more. It's one more confirmation that Turkmen GDP depends on gas prices, depends on export. Uh, the same here, exchange rate and oil prices. They put oil prices, but they could put uh, uh, gas prices as well. But easy to put the oil prices because it's uh, um, easy to track these prices. You will see as well the very strong correlation. Um, next slide. Consumer price inflation. We see the... Um, to, I, really, the numbers 2000 and 2014, I will question all these numbers, maybe except Kazakhstan. Um, just, I, I, I don't think that it was, you know, the inflation in Turkmenistan 5.6, but Uzbekistan 14, it's okay. It seems to me probably it was right numbers. But again, you will see uh, starting 2015, the changes here. And in Uzbekistan, it's uh, 2018, we see dramatical, you know, increase because uh, it's, uh, in 2016, uh, Uzbekistan launched, you know, economic reforms, uh, liberalization uh, foreign exchange, uh, tax reforms, and as well liberalization prices. They borrowed a lot of money in order to import, you know, a capital goods to improve you know, technology. So that's why you know what the prices, and uh, not only industrial as well consumer prices, you can see the inflation here. So next. Um, but I think um, when we talk about the economy and energy, and uh, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan, gas, it's, uh, uh, shows and demonstrate uh, what the what is going on in, in in the country, what kind of implications external players may have, or how this uh, you know countries can manage the situation. Um, in Turkmenistan, it's um, uh, as as I said, export fifty four percent of the production, but can export much higher volume, but there's no market so far uh, for this gas. And na right now, it's a China, Iran, and Kazakhstan. Since 2016, no gas export to the to the Russia. But now they uh, resume uh, negotiations. So we'll see what happened in uh, maybe this year. But um, Turkmenistan always was looking for uh, new markets for its gas. So has gas, has capacity, but don't have uh, access to the international market. Uh, when it comes to Uzbekistan, it's a different issue. Uzbek government never had a you know, goal like uh, increase export of gas and get more earnings. 
before maybe till 2015 or 16, let's put me 16 and 17, the policy was like the gas is just the fuel for, for, for the economy. But earnings, they can, it's a 30% only in the, in the export earnings, but they can, you know, uh, sell gold, they can sell uranium on other, you know, products. So, uh, but now Uzbekistan as well try to, try to increase gas export and looking for a new markets. But the serious problem that uh, Uzbeks, they don't have enough uh, developed uh, reserves in order to increase, you know, export. So in this case, and, uh, and challenges, what kind of challenges uh, these two countries has and how they handle this. And in, in Uzbekistan, as I said, they use domestically gas, but they want to export more and get more uh, earnings. And uh, by the way, it's an easy way to sell resources and get money. Yes, if you don't care about your population. Um, so I'm not telling that exactly the Uzbekistan just follow this policy, but just it's a normal for any country which possess the natural resources. Easy way. It's uh, um, uh, to get money. So declining production in Uzbekistan, this is one of the challenge, serious challenge. Very old technology, they need money. And um, a lack of investment exploration, this is a key problem in Uzbekistan right now. So aging energy infrastructure, and of course landlocked country, they, there's no exit only pipeline to China, pipeline to Russia, and probably pipelines, new pipelines from Turkmenistan could be as well available for Uzbekistan. So business environment so far was not friendly as well. And competition, first Uzbeks should compete uh, with the Turkmen's in terms of you know, selling gas outside. I mean, selling gas uh, in, in other markets. So that's why for Uzbekistan, it's a most challenging. It's, you know, what increase production, invest and develop in, in exploration. So what they did, they improved the environment, they invited a lot of international companies and they tried to, they liberalized completely the system. And by the way, Uzbekistan allows uh, production sharing agreements, what the Turkmen not do. Um, so, but uh, Turkmen go Uzbek government expressed the interest that they will interest in two pipelines from the Turkmenistan Tapi and Transcaspian pipelines. But will be this commercial, uh, commercially okay or not? We will see in the, in the, in the future. But in Turkmenistan, it's a rich country in the region, but so far, it doesn't play you know a key role or dominant role in in any markets. Just because there's no. Uh, new uh, pipelines, new exits. It's only, as I said, only Russia, uh, China, two small pipelines to, to Iran, and that's it. Access to the new markets and the Caspian status of Caspian Sea it was the, one of the serious problem to develop Trans-Caspian pipeline, which is under discussion since 1996. 1997, I was back working in the country, involved in all these pipelines as well. And TAPI, TAPI uh, since 2000, 1992 even. So it's a two, two, two potential pipelines which could open the door for Turkmen gas. Um, but as well, the challenge for uh, foreign companies, it's as well regulations, which the Uzbek Turkmenistan has, it's a production sharing agreement only on offshore. It means that uh, Turkmen's, they can invite foreign companies, but only to provide services. They don't want to see any foreign company in exploration and development. <coughs> it means that no production sharing agreements. So, and as well, um, uh, as the Turkmen, they want to sell the gas on a border. They don't want to participate in any pipelines, uh, uh, international pipelines, only inside. So what they did, they, yeah, so, um, okay. Uh, maybe let's move to the last and um, two pipelines. As I said, maybe my last maybe two minutes will be about this. Two pipelines, as I said, Trans-Caspian pipeline and TAPI. I'm not very optimistic about TAPI 
because of the security and financial challenges. But Transca has been pipeline and um, since last year has much better position and uh, chance to be implemented. It's a project of common interest of the EU. It means that EU has a strong interest and will finance about 50% of this pipeline. This is not financed, it's not the loan, it's a grant. We'll use the money of the EU taxpayers. And in 2017 already provided money for profit, pro profit and members of the state EU support this as well. Even the Trump in his, you know, uh, in his um, um, send, you know, uh, express his support to the pipeline. So, and I put in the right side as well about the conventions, about the status of the Caspian Sea. So I'm sorry, probably I used more time than uh, I need, but uh, if you have a question, I will be very happy to you know, answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our next spe speaker is Teresa Sabonis Health. Uh, she's a professor of national security strategy at the National War College, uh, where she's taught since 2001. She also teaches um, our series students. She teaches in the science and technology program in the Georgetown School of Foreign Service. Um, she has lived and worked in seven countries in the former Soviet Union, uh, has assisted two nations in developing their own national security strategies. Um, she has edited a number of volumes on Central Asia's political and economic uh, transition. And, um, She's published and lectured on climate change policies, post-Soviet energy and environmental issues, regional trail, trade and transit, and the politics of electricity. Welcome. And everyone always thinks the politics of electricity is the most riveting, of course. Um, all right, um, what I'm going to, I want to begin with saying that we are rightly mesmerized by leadership changes in the region right now. And I'm not going to argue that the leadership changes don't matter. They do enormously. But I would argue that for the first 15 to 20 years, the arguments that all the leaders of these countries made to their states about the purpose and direction of their leadership had to do with state survival, uh, whether it was the threats from Russia or whether it was the threats from um, violent extremism, they had a narrative of state preservation. And in the present era, what we see is the narrative is beginning to shift toward prosperity. And that shift explains some very important things about what we see now in regional relations and what we can expect to see in the future. Um, now, again, I'm not going to say that leadership transitions don't matter. Certainly the long-standing animosities between specific leaders, now that those are gone, that has opened up a lot of space. But, but I want to call your attention to how the threats have changed um, and how the opportunities have changed, because it really has been a fundamental shift. If we think about the early post-Soviet period, one of the things that the nations did was to raise barriers to travel from each other's states. Um, and it went to the extreme of um, disusing rail routes, discontinuing bus routes, there were no air routes, and so forth and so on. But now in the present day, when we look and compare at visa requirements for travel across the region, what we see is a really astonishing sort of shift back to putting a priority on movement of peoples. Um, what we see is that the most progressive states in the region include Georgia, which has no visa requirements for any state except China, of all the states that I've looked at in this, in this graphic. Um, if we look at Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, um, and Azerbaijan, they've been very progressive. There are two anomalies on this graphic, and I just got back from um, visiting in the Caucasus, so when I think about Central Asia, I really think about Caspian Sea area, and I put, I put the Caspian in to include the Central, a the Central Asian and the Caucasus states. Um, when we look and see, the only place where it is almost impossible to get a visa, it can still be done, um, but it requires fairly extraordinary effort, is for Armenians to travel to Azerbaijan is extremely different. In all other cases, even the ones that are marked yellow on here, suggesting that people who live in 
one country require a visa to go to another one. For the most part, those represent electronic visas. So those are ones that can be applied for online. They no longer require the complex invitation process that used to characterize our travel to the region. Um, and there is actually talk right now um, because the movement of peoples is, is thought of in terms of not only uh, movement among these states, but also making it easier for outside travelers to come to the region. Um, there is currently a discussion about, about um, what is called the Silk Visa, and the Silk Visa would make it possible for, um, it's specifically focused on tourism, um, and essentially Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan have announced their intent to create this common visa. Azerbaijan and Turkey um, have been told that they would be welcome to participate in this, and Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan are lobbying to be included in this. So in terms of thinking about moving people around, that has shifted from a category that was once seen as threat, and it was threat, to an area that's now seen as, as opportunity. Um, I liked what Marlene said in the previous panel about there is currently more fear of no integration than of too much integration. Um, and a lot of that has to do with what has happened in terms of opportunity. Now, when Nazarbayev was speaking last year at the heads of state meeting, he lamented the fact that only 5% of trade happens among the region. But I would argue that we have to measure that a little bit differently. If we look at actually what are the export destinations and the import origins in the region, what we see is somewhat extraordinary. What we see is that even if we think about Russia and China separately, just trade within the Central Asian region now accounts for 3% of Azerbaijan's trade, 4.5% um, of Kazakhstan's trade, 11.5% of Uzbekistan's trade. So what we're seeing is that um, in that first column, the, the, what you have there is export destinations and import origins. So if we're only looking at the region, what we're seeing is that trade amongst themselves is increasingly important to the states of Central Asia. They're trading heavily with Russia still and heavily with China, which is a new thing, but trading amongst themselves is growing in importance. And I want to highlight one specific area that may or may not be, in the long term, a good thing for the whole region, but in the near term, it has actually been very security enhancing. Um, and that is the fact that what we're seeing is a lot of trade in agriculture. Um, if we look at what has happened since the collapse of the Soviet Union. One of the troubling trends is that most of the states of Central Asia lost the capacity to feed themselves. And there was even a four year period when Kazakhstan lost the capacity to feed itself. But due to some aggressive agricultural policies and an effort to elevate trade, what we now see is that Kazakhstan has become the breadbasket for Central Asia. So, in other words, Kazakhstan is not only capable of feeding itself, um, Kazakhstan exports food to all of its neighboring states. Um, and this is especially important because the region is defined as food insecure. Um, a lot of that has to do with the cotton crop, and it may take Central Asian states another many years to move away from cotton. But in the interim, having a regional partner that can trade in food reduces their vulnerability to price fluctuations. Any state that exports a commodity like cotton and imports food and is multiply landlocked is going to be, the, the vulnerability of the people is going to be rather profound. Kazakhstan has prioritized trading food in the region. Another thing that Kazakhstan has done in the region that is somewhat extraordinary is that Kazakhstan, uh, as soon as it got the visa situation fairly well squared away in the region, um, Kazakhstan has become a destination a very important destination for labor migrants. As Russia closed down and became more aggressive about the refusal to extend visas to people who had administrative violations, Kazakhstan, looking both at prosperity in the region and its, I mean, stability in the region and its own prosperity, has become a destination spot. And the destinations, um, well, let me give you, let me give you some numbers here um, because it's really kind of extraordinary. Kazakhstan last year is reporting 1.3 million registered migrants from other Central Asian countries that are now working in Kazakhstan and sending remittances home. 
Uzbek migrants are by far the largest group, but Kyrgyz migrants, in spite of the fact that they have a privileged status in the EAEU, Kyrgyz migration to Kazakhstan has also increased dramatically. Um, there's been a 40% increase over a two-year period, and now there are over 150,000 registered Kyrgyz migrants in Kazakhstan. So Kazakhstan has made itself both a net exporter of food to the region and a net importer of some of the peoples migrating around the area. And one of the things that Kazakhstan has done is by creating a very solid migration legal process, it's given them more power to pick and choose who they want to come to Kazakhstan. And they are, not surprisingly, prioritizing bringing in the migrants with, skill, with, with high skills. Now, although the states have started trading more than they used to, um, they're still doing their record on trade is, is interesting and, and more than a little spotty. Um, although the region keeps sort of rocking the charts and doing business for improving the business environment, they still lag significantly for the world and for the greater Eurasian region in terms of trade, um, uh, in terms of how hard it is to trade. And what I've done on this chart is I've right, marked in red the indicators where for a specific state, it's worse than two times, it's more than two times worse than what we consider the sort of regional average. And what we see in almost every country, um, and the discussion earlier about the Eurasian Economic Union highlights why this issue matters, is the cost and rules that you need to comply with to, to import and export remain problematic across the region. But what we've seen is that the amount of time it takes at the border has gone down dramatically as we move more and more to keeping electronic records. Um, the border fees for imports have come down significantly, and the fees for exports have come down significantly. So in other words, instead of each state capturing as much as they can off of a little bit of trade, the states are beginning to be interested in the economic benefits of more goods and services flowing across their territory. And of course, some of this has to do with the fundamental shift in opportunity. And I want to talk a little bit about opportunity. Remember that Kyrgyzstan became the first state in the region to join the World Trade Organization, and it did that in 1998. And frankly, the economics benefits of being the only open trader in your region are very low. But in recent years, that has is, that is, um, begun to shift pretty dramatically. And I want to call your attention to not the most important reason, but the least discussed reason why these things have shi shifted. At least in America, I find that we don't focus on this enough. If we look at what is called CAREC, the Central Asia Regional Economic Cooperation Program, we see something rather extraordinary. It was founded by the Asian Development Bank and some other actors in 2001. But in 2017, China took over the leadership. They registered CAREC as an international organization, so with its own separate status in the UN. They moved the home of it to Urumqi, and in addition to China hosting it, they made the two regions that are adjacent to Central Asia actual separate members of the institution. And the purpose of CAREC is to think about infrastructure the need, re, region needs and to promote those infrastructure developments um, as a group. And they draw on funds from the Asian Development Bank, they draw on funds from the AIIB, and they draw on other funds as well. But the priority is to think regionally. And as you can see, when CARAC thinks regionally, it's not the way we usually think regionally. What you have here is seven former Soviet republics. Um, it also includes Mongolia, it includes Afghanistan, what is not included in CAREC, sort of very visibly, um, is Armenia, because Azerbaijan is included, Georgia is included, um, and Armenia's increasing isolation from the region is made more and more evident by the money that China is willing to cooperatively pour into better connecting this part of the world. In fact, if you look closely at what CAREC is doing, um, they have what they call six corridors, and each corridor um, is prioritized differently in terms, of, um, in terms of China's One Belt, One Road initiative. And they've given a high priority to quarter six. And in fact, when we look at quarter six, one thing that's really extraordinary is most of these projects have been on the books since the late 90s. 
the, the World Bank um, in a program called EATL chose what are the projects that these landlocked states most need to prosper and identified them. And those projects have remained on the books for a very long time and um, they haven't found sponsors. So if we look at the EATL portfolio overall for the whole world, that, pro that portfolio has about a 32% rate of getting funding. If we look in our own region in Central Asia, the projects have a 75% rate of funding. So it isn't that China is making up things that other nations don't agree with. China has simply taken this portfolio off the shelf of projects that were pre-vetted by the World Bank, by the, by the UN, and ascribed a funding priority to them. And so what we're seeing is that the corridors of trade are falling into place. And as those corridors come into place, we all know, and Alexander Cooley has made a real point of saying, China's good at hardware, but not at software. Those ease of doing business indicators help us think about how well are these nations doing with software. And they are still struggling with the software of trade, but it's become much more a part of their narrative, of their negotiations, and of their own priorities. So we really are seeing a shift, this shift toward awareness of the need to deliver prosperity gets very tightly tied to the need to improve the software. I want to turn to um, one issue just to sort of show you about the shift in threat and opportunity. Um, Yevgeny mentioned it earlier, but electricity is a particular fascination for me. And what you need to understand is that in the 90s and on until 2008, um, the central hub of transiting electricity in the region was Uzbekistan. And the Central Asia power system was a system designed to optimize irrigation, but it was also made to move electricity around the Central Asia region to try to make it the cheapest and most effective for the region. In 2008, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan pulled out of CAPS because all the states were desperate. It was a cold winter. They were drawing too much power from the system, and they nearly collapsed it. So both states shut it down for two weeks. When Kazakhstan reopened, Uzbekistan, for domestic political reasons, decided not to reopen. And by doing that, they cut off most of the access of the other Central Asian states to the grid. They are trying to disincentivize Rogun. They were trying to become more safely autarkic. What we're seeing now is somewhat extraordinary because they are rebuilding the CAPS infrastructure. Um, this past winter, for the first time since 2008, the states began exchanging power again. And what's happened here is each of the states is now more resilient, so it's less likely to pose a threat to the, the common grid of other states. And the accounting has gotten much better. So Turkmenistan had a longstanding grievance that Uzbekistan was falsely charging them for power they didn't take, and so they moved out of the grid as well. Now the states are much better at tracking where the electricity is coming from and going. But the other reason Uzbekistan is back in and trying to restart itself as the center of the grid is that the Central Asian states, with the help of international development, were pursuing other options. Increasingly, the Central Asian states were supplying Afghanistan rather than trading with each other. And hopefully by the end of this calendar year, CASA 1000 will be online, which enables the transfer of power across Afghanistan into Pakistan. Uzbekistan realized that in an environment of more and more trade, if they didn't become a nexus of trade, they would simply increasingly get left out. So again, I'm not diminishing the leadership of Mirzioyev, but the fundamental incentives have changed. It went from a threat to an opportunity to trade if you could participate and play in that system. So I think that one of the things that we have to keep an eye on going forward um, is, first of all, how much more disadvantaged do the two outliers, Turkmenistan and Armenia, how much more over time does it disadvantage them not to fully integrate into these systems, and how much more government effort on the part of these two states will be made to get into this system? Because we are in a world where the leaders are justifying their administrations on the basis of prosperity. And the more we move from a securitized narrative to a prosperity-based narrative, the more important it will be for the leaders to be able to demonstrate to their people that they're taking advantage of every opportunity to trade. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Theresa. Let me just follow up with a question. I mean, you said leadership maybe uh, matters a little less than it used to, but we do have a new leadership in Armenia. Um, so do you see any signs there that this new leadership, you talked about self-isolation, is interested in breaking out of that and changing its you know, attitude towards this and its policies? Well, let me start by the standard disclaimer. This doesn't rec represent official US policy at all um, or the policy of my institution. But I did just return from uh, leading a delegation to Armenia and Georgia. Mm -hmm. And what I would say is there's several things. The first one is that Armenia is beginning to insist once again that the leadership of Karabakh be included in negotiations. That could either be a way to further stall them mm -hmm or it could be a way to make them fight for their own priorities instead of Armenia always having to represent their priorities. So it remains to be seen what the strategy is here. But there is an advantage to demanding that Karabakh be at the table if Armenia is beginning to think about being willing to give something up. Um, so I see that as an important piece of the puzzle. The second thing that is curious to me, and I don't have full answers on it, is Armenia is very interested in attracting the Chinese investment. Um, Georgia has some more caution about it, and Azerbaijan, frankly, doesn't need it. Um, but Armenia does. And as Armenia pursues and attracts more Chinese investment, it will be very interesting to see what goes with that. I think one of the real problems that Armenia is suffering under right now, um, and this has happened cyclically, and I'm sad to see it happen again, is in their own domestic economic interest, um, this is a moment where they really want to be strengthening economic ties with Iran. And we're pushing them very hard not to do that. Um, so in terms of resolution of NK, they won't be able to improve relations with Turkey until something breaks in NK. I don't think the Pashinyan government is consolidated enough to do something aggressive. But I do see this introduction of Karabakh as a separate party to negotiations, if Azerbaijan allows it to happen, is a sign that they're looking for a little bit of space. Thank you. And Nadia, let me just ask you on this question of the relative importance of leadership. Um, if you're thinking about Uzbekistan, would you agree that leadership is maybe less important now? Or how would you see that? Uh, I agree that this leadership is very important. In Uzbekistan, it's definitely. Mm -hmm. And what is going on in Uzbekistan, it's just, you know, they have dramatic changes for such a short period of time. And, and I believe that Uzbekistan will be, you know, driving force for the whole region. I think now, and uh, Uzbekistan is even challenge for neighbor, neighboring countries. They are looking at the Uzbekistan like, wow, it's very important, it seems to me, that they're doing very well. And, um, and I, I hope he will not change his, you know, view about all these reforms and uh, cooperation and will further, you know, push the, all this stuff which they have. Yeah. Okay, just, just to bounce off of that, I think, I think um, Mirza Yoyev has been very important. Um, my argument would be that he's locked in this narrative that prosperity is really important to the Uzbek people. The other thing putting pressure on him is, to the extent that it was possible to persuade Tajikistan not to build Rogun, Uzbekistan may have had a incentive to do that. But Tajikistan is, is building Rogun. They're finishing the first two of the six turbines. And what you should understand is once a nation has the physical power to impound a river, and we see the same thing happening on the Nile, by the way, once the upstream state has the physical power to impound the river, the downstream states have to scramble very hard to negotiate for how rapidly that new reservoir is going to be filled. Because if you fill it slowly, it minimizes harm to downstream states. But once you have the power to, imp to impound the river, which is the correct hydroengineering term for it, you could. And so Mirza Yoyev's situation is that he can no longer prevent the construction, but it is going to be physically possible for Tajikistan to cut off Uzbekistan. So even his leadership on water negotiations is a reflection of a different reality. Thank you. So we do have time for some questions from the audience. Any questions here? Yes. <laughs> Hello, my name is Dilnoza. I'm a um, visiting research fellow at Central Asia Program in George Washington University. My question to, I'll ask my first question to Teresa. 
On your earlier comments at the start of your presentation, you mentioned for most Central Asian countries after the collapse of Soviet Union, it was mostly state survival that was the priority. And then a lot of things were sort of considered as um, sort of securitized. Um, don't you think um, securitization is a part of every country? It's a part of every regime. In the United States, for example, different objects could might have been securitized, such as terrorism or other religious matters that I'm not going to mention now. But in Central Asia, um, the state's survival or pri priority, for the sake of state's priority, at different things, a number of different things could have been and securitized. Don't you think it's actually a part of every country, every regime? Um, thank you in advance. My next question is to Nadia. In regards to energy consumption in Uzbekistan, um, that was a very useful, informative presentation. I was just wondering in regards to your data, uh, I'm sorry if I've missed where the data came from. I was just wondering if you considered um, energy consumption in terms of households, for example, in Uzbekistan, there are a lot of families that actually don't have gas meters still. They actually pay whatever agreed uh, fixed prices that does not necessarily reflect how much gas or electricity they have actually used. And there are a lot of regions that don't have um, access to gas and ele electricity. Thank you very much. Teresa, you want to start? I certainly don't mean to suggest that the states won't continue to securitize some issues. What I'm saying is that that the security narrative, the narrative that we are new states, we are fragile and we are threatened from all things, so we have to become more self-reliant, that was such an overwhelming narrative that it shut down everything else. To use an example from the 1990s, 1996-97, um, the border between Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan was very frequently sealed. And the argument was that there was a terrorist threat. In fact, there was a bread threat. Um, Uzbekistan was still heavily subsidizing um, bread for, the, for their people and the price was very low. Kazakhstan had fully opened its markets and the price for bread was much higher. So if you didn't seal the border, you had too much bread going across and you couldn't maintain your obligation to feed the people. So that's a perfect example. In this case, you can argue that even the economics of Uzbekistan required it to be as autarkic as possible. In the present day, there still are threats, and they will be securitized in all nations, and you're absolutely right about that. But I think it's no longer possible to build a narrative that each of these th states is under such overwhelming threat that state survival is the be-all and end-all, and that the state doesn't have an obligation to think about other issues of interest to the people. So the ability to make, help the people prosper is now, as you can see, embedded in the leadership narratives of all these states. Um, it didn't used to be. Uh, yes, the, the data is most of the time I draw from the World Bank and as well International Monetary Fund, but I don't have uh, numbers from the Uzbek, uh, you know, statistic uh, authorities or like that. But it's always very difficult to track the numbers when it comes to uh, household. And um, yes, there's the same story, same picture in Uzbekistan, in Turkmenistan. There is no uh, system which exactly um, can say or check how much the gas used the, the population. And uh, in Uzbekistan, situation was a little bit better. At least they paid fixed price and I probably did not burn this gas just for nothing. But in Turkmenistan, it was very bad. It was a free and a people sometimes, they just could leave the gas burning in order not to use matches. So you can understand what, what the situation was in Turkmenistan now. they. Uh, completely, you know, and um, change the system. There is no free uh, gas in Turkmenistan, so they have some, you know, shochiki, as we say. This is a real issue now in a Turkmenistan, but it's a, it was a very good move. Uh, and I agree, if we compare Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan, Turkmens, they invested a lot in order to gasification, to provide gas for uh, consumers. And even in a very small, you know, town or kolkhoz, you can find the gas. But in Uzbekistan, it was maybe uh, a little bit challenge, and I believe that the government will look at this issue and they will, you know, to do something uh, to provide more gas for for population. Thank you. Any other questions, Andy? <clears throat> Uh, thanks, Andy Cutchins. Great presentations for both of you. I have a, a question for each. Um, for Nadia, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what um, 
what is known about the prospects for uh, gas and oil reserves of Uzbekistan, um, particularly gas? You talked about uh, uh, significant potential potential there. Um, uh, Teresa, um, I was wondering if you could, on, on two issues that you looked at, one, food security. Okay. Very interesting, the, uh, the transformation of Kazakhstan's role. Um, that uh, if you put Russia into the equation, where would it where would it be on the food security issue, and also uh, on the uh, the transit corridor okay. issue, uh, which Russia is also outside of outside of Carrick. Um, thanks. Not yet. Um, yes, as I said, you know, proved res reserves. It means that really what you have right now after exploration you have really and you can develop and you can use the modern technologies probably you have much more yes because you did not spend money for exploration that's why or you have maybe reserves which is not reachable by modern technology which we have right now and always every year when the uh, technologies change we get some countries even they can oh, okay now we can uh, develop and have more gas or more oil, and so the numbers will change dramatically. In Uzbekistan, if we look at the, the, the map, Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, it is impossible to say that Uzbeks, they don't have gas reserves or have very uh, low when Turkmen's in the border exactly close to Uzbekistan has a huge resources. It means that probably Uzbeks, they did not spend all money enough for exploration. I don't want to say that they have exactly the same amount, but it's a definitely they have more than 1.2, as you saw this, see in my 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 um, table. So and um, and as well, it was the policy when Uzbeks they did not in, invest in exploration. They focused on the cotton. They focused on the. Um, produce electricity and use the gas for electricity. It's 80 percent, even maybe more, they use for, uh, for to produce electricity, Uzbeks. Now they understood that, no, this is a good money. It's a good maybe opportunity. And so that's why the government, they, they're they now trying to, to attract as much as possible international major um, oil and gas companies and exploration. So, and I believe soon, probably in a couple of years or maybe five years, we will see a completely different story when it comes to Uzbekistan. Teresa? So in terms of uh, food self-sufficiency, um, before 2005, only Tajikistan was unable to feed itself. But the change in, in population growth and shifts away from uh, subsistence agriculture um, now Kazakhstan reversed, well, so in 2005, um, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, only Uzbekistan was self-sufficient in 2005. Um, starting in 2009, um, Kazakhstan became a net exporter to the region. It now exports to all four states. It does also export agricultural products to Russia. The trick in measuring that is because of the, the, the Eurasian Economic Union, the volumes are measured differently and counted differently. But it looks as though, even though the, the, the trade is not measured as imports because it's a free trade area, um, it looks as though Kazakhstan is still exporting more to its own region than it is to Russia. And China has now entered um, and is trying to capture some of the Kazakh grain market. So the interesting question will be, how does the Chinese market grow? And, and is Kazakh food pulled from the other states into China? But Kazakhstan sees it as a matter of policy to try to make sure that Central Asia is self-sufficient. So I think that they will protect that category of exports within the region. Um, your other question was connected to? Transit quarters. Transit quarters. Um, again, what we see um, is that the transit quarters that exist to Russia are still being used. But the extraordinary thing is, if we look at the patterns of trade, um, if you look at the, the export destinations um, for Kazakhstan, China has surpassed Russia. For Kyrgyzstan, Russia still dominates. For Tajikistan, China dominates. For Turkmenistan, 
China overwhelmingly dominates, and for Uzbekistan, China dominates. So in terms of the flow to those markets, China is growing and continuing to grow. The old quarters are not falling out of use. There, there still is the trade, but what we're seeing is there's not a growth in trade. It's a, it's a stable number um, trading with Russia, whereas the Chinese demand is growing dramatically. Yes. Thank you, Laura Kennedy. Um, I wanted to ask um, uh, uh, Ms. Badikova, since, since you ran out of time on Transcaspian, if you could carry that further a little bit, both in terms of political, legal, you know, market ramifications, and also since Professor Sabonis Half was just in uh, the Caucasus, and I assume including Azerbaijan, if you could also um, give us your uh, perspective on that. Thank you. So when it comes to Transcaspian gas pipeline, uh, till 2018, uh, probably it was a yes question because of status of the Caspian Sea. Now it seems to me the situation is much clearer than we had before. And as well, we see that some serious signals from the uh, Brussels and as well from uh, uh, even the United States and um, other countries who express the serious interest in this pipeline, particularly Germany. So this pipeline has a chance to be implemented. Yes. It's, uh, there's a great chance. And of course, the, the question is that how Russia will see this you know, development. Uh, we should uh, understand that the, a lot of experts, when they talk about Transcaspian in Turkmenistan, they just try to use the very old perception. Russia is uh, 15 years ago. Now the modern Russia is completely different. And there is so, some ground for negotiations. Russia wants to uh, North Stream too. Yeah, depends on Georgia, uh, Germany. Yeah, and Germany support Transcaspian. I think there is some, you know, um, room for negotiation, consultation, discussion, and so far, so far, so on. Uh, Turkmen's really need to a new outlet. They cannot survive in this case. You know what? Otherwise, they will depend on China completely, or again, I don't believe that they will depend on, on, on Russia. So they really need something. But I'm not optimistic about Tapia at all. But probably, you know, the people, I mean, in the government in Turkmenistan, they are optimistic and they see this as maybe as a good project. But I think that this year we will see some, you know, development in this area. EU already provided money for pre-feed. So, and we will start working on the pre-feed in May this year. I mean, most engineering design works. So I'm involved in this project, and I, 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 I tell you not like the person who just to check the, the newspapers, you know what, because it's a negotiation and discussion with the countries, with the transit states as well. What, what kind of, it will be only one string, only 15 BCM, or the, what, what kind of project it will be? We will see soon, it seems to me. Teresa? Before I bounce to the view from Azerbaijan, I, I want to make a comment about, uh, about TAPI and TAP from Turkmenistan's perspective. I am optimistic that a version of TAPI will be completed, but China is proposing rerouting it. So that rather than going all the way down across, uh, across Afghanistan and into Pakistan, it would go across northern Afghanistan and into China. And I think that um, China is likely to pick up the wreckage of TAPI and take that route because China would like to develop the mines of Afghanistan and they need to have an energy delivery system closer to those mines. So I would watch for that project to be transformed and Turkmenistan will declare victory, but it will in fact not be as originally designed. In terms of TAP, again from the Turkmen perception, when we look at states, when one of the measures that's used in the industry is called the reserves to production ratio. And so to sort of oversimplify, uh, what the reserves to production ratio is telling you is if you keep doing exactly what you're doing today, you have no major technological breakthroughs and you, have no, you find no more big reserves, how long can you keep doing what you're doing? Well, the numbers for Turkmenistan are about 300 years. So even if Turkmenistan develops multiple projects at once, it's not a question of Turkmenistan's gas. It's a question of their capacity to do the negotiations, um, to solidify the routes, and to sort of escape some of their own logic. Um, and that's where I connect to Azerbaijan. From the pr perspective of SOCAR, as far as I understand it, 
uh, what SOCAR is waiting to see, and SOCAR is the state oil company of Azerbaijan, they have been pushing very hard for what is known as the technical pipeline. Bear with me a minute, because this is going to sound like it's not really exciting, but it's extremely important. Azerbaijan shifted its entire economy over to gas when they found gas reserves. And they kind of overfulfilled the plan. Um, because now they have gas shortages in Azerbaijan. They don't want to hurt their credibility as a supplier to Turkey, so they've actually been having to burn Russian mazout in their power plants to keep them going so that they don't have to use their own gas. The reason for this is partly that they shifted the whole economy so rapidly to gas. The other reason is that as the oil fields in Azerbaijan are in decline, you have to inject more and more gas to keep the oil flowing. So Azerbaijan has been proposing for several years now a deal with Turkmenistan, which is, there's a set of offshore oil fields managed by Dragon Oil. That oil has associated gas that's just being burned to get out of the way. Azerbaijan wants the Turkmen government to approve capturing that gas and pumping it to the oil wells of Azerbaijan so that they can use the waste gas of Turkmenistan and free up more of their own gas for their people and their market. Turkmenistan has alternately said they're interested, not interested, maybe yes, maybe no, but they're still making very slow progress on this. Azerbaijan is interested in going up to 10 BCM with the technical pipeline. They consider it proof of concept. If Azerbaijan can't deliver that, they are not confident about the future of the Transcaspian. The Turkmen, on the other hand, regard that as suspicious because they think Azerbaijan doesn't want to transit more gas than they themselves produce. So there's a, there's a perception problem that the two states are trying to work through. That bilateral relationship matters more than anything else in the resolution of the Transcaspian now that the C agreement is signed. If those two states can come to an understanding of each other's interests and a compromise of interests, um, then it will go forward. One of the most aggressive negotiators trying to make this thing work is Georgia which wants to be a transit state for even more gas, so they're very enthusiastic. But frankly, as a transit state, Georgia's role, other than being convening people and trying to make this better, is very limited. It depends on Azerbaijan and Turkmenistan, um, so it, it depends on how they perceive risk. Turkmenistan's usual pattern is to be so afraid of political risk that they're sort of frozen in place and mesmerized until they reach a significant economic crisis and then they take a large risk. Um, that may be how this situation unfolds. Can I add? Yeah. Has two words. It's, um, at, I think it's not the dragon oil, it's a Petronas gas for its a connection of platforms. Yes, but uh, Turkmen's they don't agree with this idea, and there's no even discussion on that right now. And the statements which was made by Turkmen's officials very clear in Baku last year, in this year as well, that only Polnatsenny pipeline. It means only pipeline, not the connections of two platforms. That's the that's, uh, that's, uh, idea which the uh, Turkmen tried to push. They didn't agree when they had a very bad situation two, three years ago, but now that when the price is oil and gas, it's much better. I don't believe that, and as well, the Russia arrived and again uh, offered uh, some you know, new negotiation and uh, some new deal. I don't believe that Turkmen will change this idea. This idea pushed by uh, BP, because BP uh, wants to improve the commercial numbers and top, that's it. That's, that's the key point. But Turkmen, they don't want to be, again, in a situation as it was in 1997, uh, when the Azeris first and uh, Turkey signed agreement for 30 BCM Transcaspian, and after that they cut uh, half. That was the end of the story in 1997, 1998. So my, I, I don't believe that Turkmen will do anything like that right now. They had a lot already. So it will be only Polnatsenny pipeline or nothing else. Maybe Russia again will dominate in this area. Another stuff is that Germany interested in, Palna, in a pipeline, not in a connection, because Germany wants to have more gas from this area to in Baumgarten and to be the real dominant gas distributor in Europe. From north, it's a Russian gas, southern gas as well from the southern corridor. They are just right now behind the scene. You cannot see any uh, statements made by Germany, but 
we work with these governments, so I see that, you know, what they're pushing and what, what is going on right now. So it's, it's just, just observation. No, and, and there will be a, a huge transit state issue even if you get, even if you get uh, once you get underway. But transit, yeah. you know, it's, tra okay. it's, it's okay. <laughs> we can okay. talk we're, about we're, that. We will continue this discussion over lunch and we'll be discussing these yeah. issues. So please okay. join me in thanking our panelists for a very interesting panel.